I'm going to talk about it from principally a Western perspective, just because of time constraints. And in many ways, the Western debates are quite unique, and they're certainly influential in our lives, and the lives that we're leading here. So let me give you a quick, brief history of ethical thinking. You may recognize this painting. A lot of art, art historians would call this one of, the, one of the highlights of the Renaissance. Raphael painted it in, in 1509-1510 for the Apostolic Church of the Vatican, and it's called the Greek School. Up there in the, uh, it's very hard to point out, Socrates in the brown, the two central figures, the one in, in red and, and a sort of clear color, long beard, Plato beside him, more youthful, brown hair, earth tones and sky and water tones, Aristotle, Lounging on the front stairs, Diogenes to his right, Pythagoras. We're not sure who most of the figures are. We know, we know, we have pretty good ideas of many of them, but we don't have photographs, so it was very hard to figure out um, who the artist intended to be who. But we do know that the idea was to, was, was to capture the richness of philosophy. This was one of four frescoes painted for the church, and this, the focus of this one was philosophy. It was wisdom. It was about ethical discourse. And things start, in our tradition, largely with Socrates and Plato. Because when Plato was the person who made the argument that, that life is about ethics. Life is about justice. Politics is rightly about, the eth about applied ethics. About creating conditions in which people will do the right thing, the good thing, the just thing. Plato argued, one of his most famous arguments was that what's your most trusted source for ethical discourse? It's philosophy. He said religion, religious people may tell you that you should do this or you should do that, and they may or may not be right, but they can't prove it to you, and you have no way of knowing whether they've interpreted things correctly. He said, philosophers alone will lead you step by step through their reasoning. And they say, this is what you should do, and here are the reasons. And you can challenge them at any point. You can say, I don't agree with that because of this, this, and that. He said, philosophers ultimately are your most trusted source for ethical discussion. Therefore, countries, states should be led by philosophers. Philosophers should rule the world. They're the ones who understand what a just society should, should look like. It turns out what a just society should look like is a society in which people do what they are best suited to do. Some people rule because they're best suited to rule. Other people produce because they're best suited to produce. Some people guard because they're best, best suited to guard. In the, in, in, in the Republic of Plato, Plato's discussion of this, he's challenged by a cynic, Thrasymachus, who says, you know what? He said, I'll tell you what ethics is. Ethics is about people who are rich and powerful saying, this is what you should do. And they do it for one reason, to stay rich and powerful. And if the weak agree with that, say, okay, you want me to do this, you want me to obey, you want me to hand over some of my money, then they're just stupid. And for the past 2,500 years, people have debated, is, it, is, is, is ethics just sort of the rich and powerful, constructing a world which keeps them in place, or is it something more than that? Is it something that is objective? Something that we can all determine in some way or another? What is ethics really about? Plato's the most famous student, and here um, you have an interesting picture. Plato on, the, on, on, on your left, with his finger pointing to the air and colors of fire and air. People think about him having this philosophical posture. Aristotle in earth colors and water colors, more grounded, pointing at people, the empiricist. Aristotle was uncomfortable with the idea of a, of a, of the, of the sort of strict society that a philosopher would design, in which each of us was assigned a specific role. And in Plato's world, we had no children because children create effective bonds with parents, parents create effective bonds with children, this sort of leads people to do things which aren't good and right. So all children will be raised communally in his world. 
And those who were smart would do this, and those who were fast would do this, and those who were good with music would do that. But there'd be no favoritism in that world. Aristotle said, this is not really what humans are about. Humans are about things like friendship. He decided that what we're really about as people is happiness or well-being, eudaimonia. And the way to, 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 to achieve a state of well-being, of happiness, was to live a virtuous life, a good life, an ethical life. And it wasn't always clear what that was. So we had to learn through experience. We had to learn through observation. We had to learn through discussion. And the goal was, he said, we have a general sense of what it is. It means to be courageous. It means to be wise. It means to be fair. It means to be altruistic. It means to be temperate. Those are virtues. But he said exactly what it requires us to do is not clear. He gave us one indicator. He said somewhere between extremes is where is the sweet spot of ethical behavior. Between recklessness and cowardice is courage. And we're trying to find those sweet spots, and we're trying to live in accordance with them. Now, a lot of people said that this sort of set the platform for our thinking about ethics. Here we had the cynics, we had the people who thought it was sort of about society and roles in society, the people who thought it was sort of about virtue and cultivating our own virtuous characters. Over time, lots of people respond to us. The Stokes would argue that somewhere inscribed in nature is a set of laws which are universal, and if we can access them, we'll know what's good and what's right and what's just. And they're written perhaps by God. And they're accessible to everybody if they know how to find them. Epicureans focused on moderation. The good person is the person who is moderate in all things. A radical sea shift came when Christianity displaced antiquity. A movement that began around, around the beginning of, 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 of the 5th century and was completed sometime around the year 800 when Charlemagne was crowned as a Christian, as a leader of Christianity. Christianity took, a very, took us in a very different direction, or at least it began to take us in a very different direction. And the early Christians said, what is the good life? What is the moral life? It's a life of withdrawal, of disengagement, autoexusia, a life of self-rule. The most virtuous person was the person who disengaged from everything who didn't need to consume, didn't need relationships, but instead focused on his or her personal relationship with something greater, something bigger, with God. Many early Christians moved into the desert. They distanced themselves from people. They started to attach tremendous value to things like celibacy, to abstinence. The New Testament, there were three real, three important books that sort of defined moral thinking for about a thousand years in Western history, from about 200 to about 1200. The first was the New Testament, and its simple message probably, it's obviously it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a huge book with lots of complexity and nuance, but one of its simple messages that everybody apprehends is the notion of reciprocity. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And many people feel that is the core of our ethical understanding. We do things that we would expect other people, we treat people the way we would like to be treated. And that is the core of what moral behavior is. A second important and influential work was St. Benedict's Rules, in which he stressed the importance of obedience. The ethical life was a life of obedience. A life where you did what you were told by somebody who was in a position to tell you what was good and right. The abbot of the monastery, your priest. But perhaps the most, in, the most dramatic departure from classical thinking was written by St. Augustine in the City of God. We tried to understand how could, this, how could Rome, this eternal city which once had, had, which, which once had a million inhabitants, which brought wealth from the surrounding countryside, for miles and miles into the surrounding countryside, it brought in slaves, and it brought in food, it brought in water, brought wool. It built incredibly, incredibly beautiful and complicated architectural infrastructure. 
water conduits and roads, the Colosseum. How could it have collapsed so dramatically under the pressure of barbarian invaders? And he decided the real answer was that we lived in a state of sin. We lived in a state of sin when people were sinful. And he developed a notion of two worlds. One, the world that we're living in, where people are imperfect and sinful. And the other one, which he called the second life, eternal life, which if we were lucky we would get, where people were perfect. He said life is punishment. Life is a punishment. It's a punishment for disobedience. We disobeyed God, we were punished for it. Kicked out of Eden, and subjected to hunger, to disease, to lust, to growing old, to, to being tired, to having to work. We were, we were, so life was largely about sin. <coughs> to talk about ethics and morality and justice in this world, for St. Augustine was a bit of a stretch. A bit of a stretch, because we couldn't have it here. We'd already lost that. This was a smart choice for Christianity, it turned out, because he basically said to the rulers who were not Christian, we don't care what you do. We do not care what you do. Rule how you want. Take our money. Do what you want. We don't care. Just leave our churches alone so that we can educate people. So that we can, and what we'll give you in return for peace is obedient subjects. Now, as we know what happened, the rulers looked at the steel and said, that's not a bad deal. You'll, give, you'll, you'll, you'll let us collect taxes, you'll let us rule, and all we have to do is leave your churches unmolested. Over the course of the next few hundred years, churches sprung up all through Europe, through Northern Africa, into the UK, and all of a sudden one day, the churches stopped obeying secular authorities. They had become so powerful. Nobody knows if St. Augustine had a master plan, if he, if he saw this as a way to displace secular authority, but it worked that way in the end. In the Middle Ages, the late Middle Ages, the end of the Middle Ages, when the church had reached its peak, people began to look at it and said, where is this austerity? Where is this celibacy? Where is this, where is this disengagement from lust and sin, from theft? People like Marcellus of Padua began to see the church as a very powerful entity which was acting a lot like the secular rulers that it displaced. And so he began to say, he said, you know what? St. Augustine got it right in the first, the first time around. Morality and ethics are about the world, here, the world up there, not about the world down here. In fact, the church has no authority in the world down here. He said, the world down here is about something else. It's about commerce, it's about security. It's about building houses. It's about farming. You can have morality and ethics, but it has nothing to do with secular rule. He began to, do, to separate what we now think of as church and state. And in the early Renaissance, Machiavelli, Italian statesman from Florence, took this and said, this is exactly right. Social life, political life isn't about ethics. It has very little to do with ethics. It's not about virtue, at least not in the sense of, not in that Christian sense, not in that classical Greek sense. It's about power. Thrasymachus was right. St. Augustine was right. It's about power. It's about getting power, holding on to power. That's what life is about. And you're either in charge driving the cart, or you're inserted and you're pulling the cart. Those are the options that we have. Now, Machiavelli was a pretty complicated thinker. And a lot of people have read the prints and the discourses and said, actually, when you read them carefully, he was looking at these tough guys, condottieri, people who were taking over Venice, taking over Florence, and he was saying to them, yeah, I understand you. It's all about power. It's all about rules. It's all about money things. It's all about extracting wealth from people. It's all about enlarging your domains. It's all about having your way. That's what life is really and truly about. And people who adopt a Christian attitude, they're weak. 
They're easy prey. They're the ones to plunder. They'll turn the other cheek. They're fools. Life goes, the good things of life go to the people who have the courage to grab them, to take them. And he said, but if you want to stay in power, if you want to stay in power, you've got to, you've got to supplement your strong arm tactics with good laws. It's easier in the long run. It's easier in the long run if you let, let your subjects have their property, have their wives, have their farms, unmolested, untouched. They'll be easier to rule. And a lot of people think that what he was trying to do was to introduce ethics in the back door. We don't know for sure what his goal was. We do know he was only the beginning of a long trajectory that wondered whether moral life was even possible. Thomas Hobbes said, you know what morality really is? Morality, for me, is what I want, what gives me pleasure. And for you, it's what you want, what gives you pleasure. That's what morality is. There's nothing objective up there. He said, if there was, people would have figured it out. But they've been arguing about it for 2,000 years. They've been debating what's good and what's right and what's just for 2,000 years. And nobody has come to a complete agreement. And the reason is because there isn't any answer. There's no answer to that question. Yes, we have this long, fancy debate going back centuries. We've had it because they're asking a question that cannot be answered. We share one thing in common. None of us want to die a premature, violent death. That's where we start. That's the starting point of building a strong society, is to assume that none of us want to die a premature, violent death. Life is about security. That's what it's about. And if you, get, and if you live in a society allows you to live more years rather than less years, then that's a success. That's a success story. You should be happy with it. And it shouldn't matter to you what the leaders claim to be ethical behavior, as long as you can live as many years as possible. Now, Bufendorf Law began to challenge that. They said, this can't be all life's about. It can't just be about the strong, the powerful, get in your way. Is that all life is really about? Do all the good things just go to the greedy, the grasping, the strategic? Or do only fools turn the other cheek? Or only fools altruistic? Pupendorf and Locke began to think, began to argue, no, there's got to be something more than that. To be human is somehow to be moral. There's a natural law out there. And that natural law, and this was the radical move, that natural law is accessible to everyone. And what it really does is it gives all of us the capacity to challenge those rulers, to challenge those leaders, to challenge kings, to challenge popes, to challenge anyone who says, we ought to obey them because they're the king, they're the pope, they're whoever. They have all, they, they're the ones with the inside knowledge of what is right and what is good and what is just. Locke said, everyone has that. We all know what is right and what is good and what is just. And that gives us not just the capacity to challenge authority, but it gives us the obligation to challenge authority when it misbehaves. Now, this was an inspiring and also dangerous doctrine. It was a doctrine which ultimately would be picked up by the United States and used as a foundation for, for the constitution of our country, the right to revolution. This notion that you could challenge authority and you could challenge it on moral grounds. You could say to people, you are not behaving morally, you have no right to rule our country. And you could rise up against them, unseat them, and put somebody else in place. Rousseau agreed that life was largely about morality. He said, and, and interestingly enough, these days scientists, many scientists have worked to confirm Rousseau's notion that we are by nature compassionate. And we have a level of understanding which is qualitatively different than any other species. And it's that combination of understanding and compassion which gives us the ability to be moral beings. Unfortunately, according to Rousseau, we've made such bad decisions that we would probably never find our way back to a moral lifestyle. 
Kant also agreed life ultimately is about being more. And he said, then there's, there's, this isn't such a mystery. We can figure out what we need to do. We should ask ourselves some simple questions. Would we accept our behavior being turned into a law and ourselves subject to it? Are we thinking of people as ends rather than as means to get something? Would our behavior fit into a world in which there are multiple ends? He said, if you can answer those questions, then you're on the track, you're on the right track to moral behavior. Kant, Bentham, Bentham said, let's recover no ourselves notion of happiness, of eudaimonia. Moral behavior is a behavior which creates the largest amount of happiness for the most people in society. That's how we measure it. Over the past couple of centuries, there's been lots and lots of takes, but they use the same vocabulary. Cynical views, there's no such thing as moral life, there's no such thing as ethical behavior. It's for the weak, it's for the foolish, it's for the people who are going to be on the losing end of every stick, of every battle, of every confrontation. Life is a lonely place. All the way to people who make the argument that Moral behavior is natural, it's normal, it's right, it's what humans do, it's what distinguishes us from other species, our capacity to care about others, to be altruistic. In the 20th century, the last century, there have been lots and lots of animated debates between people trying to figure out, does ethics matter at all? Is it all a word game? Is it all a mask? For what are really sort of ruthless people getting their way in society, making themselves rich and powerful at the expense of all its dummies who obey the rules? Is that really the best way to understand life? That you're either a dummy obeying the rules or you're a rich and powerful person disregarding them? Is it something that defines the character of the communities we live in? How we allocate everything from education to health care? Is it something very individual? We have to figure out for ourselves what moral life requires us to do. There's been lots of interesting developments in the past 30 or 40 years as we've come into greater contact with other cultures and tried to figure out is moral behavior in one culture as authentic and right as it is in another culture? Are they basically saying the same thing? If they seem to be saying something radically different, can one trump the other? We probe the issue of gender and ask, does, does it matter? Are there differences between men and women that are morally significant? And we introduce the question of the unnatural environment. What I want you to take out of this are just a few key terms that define the whole discussion of ethics. Key terms. Is ethics deontological? Is it about rules? Thou shalt not kill. That's the rule. Doesn't matter what the conditions are, that's the rule, and moral behavior requires you to obey the rule. Is it about consequences? Is it thou shalt not kill, unless killing saves a whole lot of lives, protects your family? Or is it about personal character and virtue? Are you aspiring to be a particular type of person? Is that what moral life is all about? Is it driven by the individual? Is it driven by the community? Where, ultimately, do our moral intuitions and values come from? Do we figure them out through deliberation? Do they come from God? Are they inscribed in the in some holy text or in nature? <coughs> are artifacts of cultural production? Or is it just a veil for raw power relationships? Is it just a language which takes the edge off the fact that life is largely about coercion, that life is largely, from any perspective, unfair? It's about haves and have-nots, powerful and weak, rich and poor. 
however we understand ethics, how do we apply it to real world situations? Let's say we say that, that we believe that something should be allocated, jobs should be allocated on the basis of merit. You should get a job because you deserve it. Somebody interviews a group of people, and they say, well, I'm giving it to this person because she's the best looking. Is that fair? She might say, you know why I'm the best looking? Because personal hygiene, I watch my diet, I work out all the time. I have a, somebody, I have a consultant who advises me on how to dress. I deserve this job. What we discover is that simple things like merit are hard to fully understand and, and look at. They're not self-evident always. And finally, what's our motivation? Do we obey? Do we, do, do we think we should be ethical because we're afraid of the consequences of not being ethical? Do we think we'll be happier or somehow more fulfilled if we are? Or as people, some, some scientists today argue, is it really a survival mechanism honed by evolution? It's a smart strategy to be ethical, to care about other people. This is the background for discussions of environmental ethics which have taken shape over the past 30 or 40 years. You may be familiar with Thoreau and his famous book where he talks about going into disengaging from society and going into nature. And in the 19th century, sometime in the 19th century, a whole lot of forces converge to amplify the interest many people had in nature. There were tales about exotic lands that had been becoming more and more authentic for a couple of hundred years as the world was explored. People probing further into uncharted territories. There was the belief that if we could contemplate nature, we could understand the mind of God. There was a sense that nature was renewal. If we moved into nature, we got out of the dirty city, the bleak city, the polluted city. And there was something valuable about standing there with just the sky above us, no people. It was a transcendent moment. Surrounded by trees, big, powerful things, the powerful forces that put everything into perspective, that helped us make sense of the world we were involved in. There was also growing concern for how people treated animals. It's interesting. French historian Robert Darwin writes a, wrote, wrote a book, The Great Cat Massacre, in which he described how in the Middle Ages, one of the, one of the things many towns did because they had, they had problems with cats and, and, rat and, and uh, other vermin, was they would have these festivals where they would creatively kill as many as possible. They would chop off their legs and chop off their heads. They would skin them alive. They'd throw them into boiling water. They'd toss them into fires. The whole town would go crazy, killing cats, rounding cats up and killing them. They would do everything imaginable to get rid of all these cats. And he suggested nobody thought for a second that this was cruel. Because it was funny. It was a break from day-to-day -day life. Let's round up a whole bunch of cats and do horrifying things to them for the next two or three days. Because cats don't have feelings, cats don't have memories. Slowly, for a variety of reasons, probably largely due to scientific studies of animals, people began to say, hmm, maybe there's a little more there. And so we started to see movements to prevent cruelty to animals. All of these things converged, and they converged into what we now call environmental ethics. Environmental ethics, I should tell you at the outset, is not, is not a field which is, is, is universally applauded. In fact, it's actually a field that has invited a lot of hostility. A lot of people around the world see it as very elitist. Who cares about the environment? This is rich kids who want to preserve wilderness. That's what environmental ethics is all about. Rich kids who have the time to go out to Yosemite or Joshua Tree with their Gore-Tex rain gear and their SUVs <coughs> has nothing to do with the real world. It's a, it's a neo-colonial attitude. It's an American attitude. It's, it's the US, it's Canada, it's Australia trying to protect big, big areas of our land in Africa or Asia. 
land we can't afford to put aside and protect because we have a lot of people who are poor and hungry. It's just another wave of colonialism trying to force us to protect areas and keep people out of them. People think of the famous stories of Richard Leakey going to Africa to protect megafauna and hiring guards to keep the poor local people out of his area. An expanding area that got bigger and bigger as he struggled to protect with the support of environmentalists in North America, elephants and, and zebras. From protect them from what? From the people who had lived there for millennia. It's culturally insensitive. People parading up in their Gore-Tex gear to stop Inu Inuit from their se the annual seal hunt, something that's gone on for hundreds, thousands of years, something they don't understand. It's uninformed. People just asserting GMOs are bad for you without any real scientific basis for making the, that assert assertion. It fails to appreciate how special people are. We are a special species. We, have, we do something that no other species does. We produce culture. We have produced the great Gothic cathedrals, the great mosques, the great temples, the great buildings, the great painting, the great music. That's what people do. You, and nature is part of our means of doing this. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with a focus on human culture. It's incoherent and patronizing. What does it mean to assign animals' rights? What does it mean to talk about animals' rights? Are they deliberating? Are they, are they in agreement with us? Or is it just some hopeless act of arrogance to say these animals have these rights? It's offensive. Peter Singer, the famous philosopher, has argued, has, has argued, well, the taboos on sexual behavior are slowly eroding, bit by bit, we're, we're allowing a larger and larger terrain of sexual behavior. What is, what, what is this artificial border between one species and the next? For genetically similar to monkeys and other animals, what's, that, what's, the, what's the taboo? Why shouldn't we push past that one as well? A lot of people, of course, have found his, article, his famous article, Heavy Petting, to be deeply offensive. Well, as people say, the whole thing is superfluous anyways. We've already figured out that we shouldn't be cruel to animals. We already know that. We don't need a special branch of ethics to instruct us in these things. But there may be something here, and I want to quickly review what it might be. There's sort of two general approaches to environmental ethics. One that, that looks at it from a human perspective, in which we are the key players in the world, and it makes the argument that thinking about adding nature into our moral deliberation is a prudent thing to do, it's an enlightened thing to do. And then there's a biocentric set of approaches, which say, look, we are part of the great web of life. We are part of something much bigger than ourselves. This web of life goes back billions of years, 3.8 billion years, and it will continue long after we are gone. We're just a little, we're just one of millions, hundreds of millions of species that have been on this earth. We've got to put ourselves into a much broader perspective, the perspective that you do get when you walk out into the desert, when you hike in Yosemite, when you look at the splendor of nature, when you see what's available out there. And when we understand that, we'll start to realize that things have value that we can't appreciate. They have what's called intrinsic value. And the system fits together, the world fits together in ways which we, can, we are only beginning to touch upon. It's amazing that, that, we create this, that this world has been created, that life took shape, that it's evolved. We've got to put ourselves in perspective here. Those mosques and those churches, those Gothic cathedrals are wonderful. But take a look at nature before we start claiming that our cultural productions are the most impressive things. There's a whole lot of perspectives, a multiplicity of perspectives, and I'm going to just touch upon a couple of them to give you a sense. 
I'll start with some of the anthropocentric ones. This, this image, this famous image of tulip fields. Striking. Garrett Hardin. Garrett Hardin argued that what we need to do to protect nature is turn it into private property. That was the good and right thing to do. We need to privatize nature. Because if we don't, if we, if we cling to this belief, this old belief, that nature is that we're part of that nature is something bigger than ourselves, that it should be accessible to everybody. And what happens is nobody has an incentive to protect it. He called this the tragedy of the commons, and he said, look what's happening. Look what's happening to the oceans. Nobody owns them, so they're being overfished, they're being dumped in, they're being destroyed. If we want to protect the oceans, privatize them. Remember John Locke, chapter five of the second treatise on government on property. How do we acquire property? We mix our labor with nature. It's the good thing to do, it's the right thing to do. It's not only God's injunction, be fruitful and multiply, which Locke interpreted as go out there and work nature, turn it into something of greater value. But according to Garrett Hardin, it was the right solution to our environmental woes. Privatize nature, and stop reproducing. If you want to know what is good and just from the perspective of that world out there, that world of trees and rocks and flowers, it was fairly simple. Slow down population growth and privatize things. Other people focus on what will we leave into future generations. I'm sure you're all, all familiar with the definition of sustainable development. Satisfying the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to satisfy their own needs. Some people focused on the aesthetic value of nature. We should preserve it because it's beautiful. Or we should preserve it because we don't fully understand it yet. It may have the cure to cancer is a famous example. Somewhere out there are medical therapies which we have never discovered. And if we destroy things, if we transform them too quickly into suburbs and malls and roads, we lose beauty and we lose value. We need to preserve nature. Our, our, what is good and right to do is to protect nature. It's valuable to us. Some people say, if we look at all the world's religions, look at Christianity, for example, there's St. Francis of Assisi. We'll discover that there's an injunction there to preserve nature. It is the creation of something divine. And as St. Francis was famous for thinking, nothing God created could be bad or can be improved upon. So we should be very, very modest and humble in going out there and changing everything around. We should protect this magnificent creation. Social ecology. And this is a different social ecology than, than we might have here at the university. But social ecology is famous for the idea that, that really environmental ethics, questions about our relationship to the natural world, about what is good and right to do to nature, to the ocean, to the forests, it's only a problem because our social relationships are so immoral and unjust. We've got to drill down in the other direction, stop exploiting people because of gender or ethnicity, culture. And when we start getting our own act in order, we'll discover that, we can't, that it becomes much harder to exploit the nature on which we all depend. Ecofeminism have attacked the tendency in the Western tradition to simplify the world into a set of dualisms, reason versus emotion, nature versus civilization, and to imply that one of them was superior to the other, or reason superior to emotion. Plato's argument. Civilization is superior to nature, Locke's argument. They ask us not to simplify this world 
the world in this way, but instead to look at the continuities and differences across things that we don't fully understand. To harbor some sort of ontological reverence for difference, for a principle of difference. To appreciate continuities across differences, but also to have reverence for things that are different. Biocentric perspectives, biocentric perspectives are much more aggressive. They say, throw out all that way of thinking, get rid of it, move beyond it. It's largely responsible for the dilemma that we find ourselves in today. Our world is a mess. And if we think we can solve it by tinkering with a philosophy that has allowed us to destroy it for 2,500 years, we're wrong. We need to reorient ourselves in a much more dramatic way. One of the most famous examples of this was Aldo Leopold's land ethic. Composed 60 years ago, it argued that we need to think of ourselves as part of this community, a bigger community, a community that we needed to understand by through science. And what was good and right was to do the things that would make this broader community include not just us, but also the forests and the grasslands and the marine areas, the oceans, that would make this larger community healthy and flourishing. Things that we did that would lead to the flourishing of this broader community in which we depended on were good, they were right, they were just. Things that diminished its ability to flourish and be healthy were wrong. And for Leopold, the key was science. Science would help us understand what was good and what was right to do. Science would help us understand how to be moral beings. Because science was our entry point into nature. Peter Singer, building on him, Jeremy Bentham, the, utilit the utilitarian thinker, said, I don't care whether animals can think, I don't care if they have memories, I don't care if they can deliberate, I don't care if they can talk, the only thing I care about is can they suffer. And I look at an animal, if it's being beaten, I say that animal can suffer, therefore it's wrong. It's wrong to beat it. Peter Singer takes this argument much more, much further. He, see, he says to us, he says, well, listen, somebody's in a coma, a coma that they're not likely ever to recover from. They can't reciprocate, they can't communicate, they can't deliberate, they can't do things that are altruistic, probably can't feel. Can we do anything we want to them? Can we do anything we want to that body? He says, we can't. We know we can't. We may not be able to fully articulate why we can't, but we know it's wrong. He said, he, said, he said, animals are much the same. They may not be able to communicate, they may not be able to deliberate, but we can't do anything we want to them. They have some intrinsic value. They have a telos, a purpose. We don't understand it very well. We should leave them alone. We should give them their autonomy. We should let them be what they are by nature supposed to be to grow up to be animals, romping through the woods, doing animal things. And that means that we need to think very carefully about agriculture and scientific experiments and so on and so forth. Deep ecologists take us even further. This is Arne Nace, the famous Norwegian, married to Diana Ross of the Supremes. Not an elf. <laughs> Possibly Norway's most famous person. Certainly one of the most widely cited thinkers. And what he wanted to argue is that society has distanced us from nature. We've got all these technologies that mediate between us and nature. We don't know where our food comes from. We don't know where our energy comes from. We don't understand that we don't have to live according to night and day. We've, we've got the weather under control because our cars and our homes can be air conditioned and heated. We've lost all touch with nature. And guess what? We're unhappy, we're stressed out, we're tired all the time, we're lonely, we're a mess. We're unhappy people and we've lost touch with nature and those two things are related. Those two things are related. 
We need to put our lives back into some sort of synchronization with this larger world around us, this world that we've tried to disengage from as completely as possible. Turn off the air conditioning. Stop being afraid of a little bit of heat or a little bit of cold, a little bit of rain, a little bit of snow. Start to understand the rhythms of nature. And as we do that, we'd get better sleep, we'd eat better, we'd understand things better, we'd understand the implications of eating this or doing that. Because we would see it in this grand sense, we'd see it in this sense of this, of, of, of this incredible thing that functions in a whole lot of amazing ways around us, day after day to support us, which we have turned our backs upon. And so what he says is we've got to plug back into those rhythms, those processes. We've got to understand them. We have to, we have to strive for a biocentric identity. Not an idea that's disengaged from nature, but one that is fully engaged with nature. And he called this ecosophy. You may have heard of Fritz Kapra's notion of eco-literacy. He said, we will not be happy. We will not, be, we will not solve our dilemmas of stress and fatigue and the sense of a, of a meaningless life as we purchase one more commodity, as we watch one more hour of TV. I have said this for these great guys. Nobody sits on their deathbed. Nobody sits there at the age of 85 or 90, looking back at their life and saying, I wish I'd been a little more disengaged. I wish I'd watched a little more TV. I wish I'd had a little more fast food. I wish I'd bought a few more things at Walmart. When we examine our lives, those are not going to be, the, all of those are the things that, that we spend our time on. Those are not going to be the things we look back on and wish we had done more of. We may wish we had spent more time hiking, more time with family, more time with friends, more time playing music, more time finding God, more time doing a whole lot of things. But we're not going to wish we had spent more time at the mall, more time watching reruns of our favorite TV show. At least that's what these guys think. Gaia theory, James Lovelock wants to argue that Earth, we should think of Earth as an organism, as a living thing that regulates itself, that makes life possible. All of these notions, the anthropocentric ones, the biocentric ones, they're all a response to this growing mounting concern that we are destroying the natural environment. Day by day, we are putting more and more intense pressure on the natural environment. Our behavior is not sustainable. You have seen in earlier lectures, people arguing, our problems are this big, our solution set is this small. We play around at the edges. We play around at the edges, carrying around cups so that we can, we can fill them with coffee. But we don't attack the meat of the thing the big issues which, are, which, which we need to attack to reduce the pace of global warming, biodiversity loss, and so on. And what all these people have suggested is, is that this destruction of the environment is a moral dilemma, it's a moral challenge, it's a moral problem for us. It may be a moral problem because we have, over the over centuries, created a false division between ourselves and the rest of nature, or it may be because the harm that we're doing to nature is made possible because nature has become a convenient medium for exploiting people, especially people in the future. We can take, we can take actions now which impose penalties in 20, 30, 50, 100 years, and we don't have to pay the cost. We can move Polluting, polluting factories into the weakest parts of the world, into the weakest civilizations. We can take away their water, we can take away their forest cover. They can't do anything to us. We, all we know is we have nice furniture and nice clothes and good food, and we don't have to see the costs. 
we found very convenient ways to shelter ourselves from the costs of our behavior. We displaced it unto the poor and the weak, the distant, the remote. We projected into the future. And we don't have to worry about it. Now, however you look at it, you'll be familiar with this, however you look at it, all of these, all of these different perspectives, these different ideas are telling us that we need, that, we, that to have a sustainable world, we need to think about the, our relationship to nature, either from an environmental perspective, as something that's morally considerable, or from a human perspective, as a medium we use to exploit and harm other people. We need to think of these things that we need to correct them, and if we don't, then we cannot really talk about sustainability. Now, I said at the beginning of this, of this lecture that, you know, here we are, a country which prides itself on our deep belief that people are good and that we're good. On our deep commitment to doing what is good and right and just. And yet we have this sense that this isn't the world that we live in anymore. That our world is not doing the things that are good and right and just. There's this huge gap between the world we live in the world we see ourselves living in, and the world we claim to believe in. And no doubt the complexity of our problems. Who can fully understand the implications of, if somebody says to you, you can't allow stem cell research because stem cell research immediately leads to reproductive cloning, and reproductive cloning would be horrible. Are they right? Who, do, who knows whether that's, that argument is, is persuasive or not? These are complicated things to understand. We have massive debates in our country about virtual images on the internet. And what sort of status do we, do we give them? We're not sure, is it right or wrong to use performance enhancing things? What would be wrong with it? If it gives you an edge at the Olympics, what's wrong with performance enhancing drugs? We're not quite sure what how to answer all these questions. We sense that they're big and they're complicated. Some people, of course, feel that they've got them all figured out, but a lot of people are not sure about them. The natural environment, however, might just give us a platform to lead moral lives. It might be a basis for a type of renewal, for closing the circle between the world we live in and the world we believe we should be living in. You may be familiar with Pareto's 80-20 rule. He, said he, he makes this argument, which has been widely validated in many fields, that 80% that of the effects can be linked to 20% of the causes. In other words, if this is the realm of behavior up there, change 20% of it, and you'll get 80% of the outcome you want. We know that there are serious environmental problems. And what Pareto's rule says is, if we, take, if we do what's good and right, on the 20% that we can agree on, where we have real leverage because we have unity, because we see things the same way, we don't have to worry about the 80% where we disagree and where there's uncertainty and so on. Because if, if we act, if we commit ourselves to that, be, that area where we feel we're on solid ground, we will get 80% of the effect we want. And it's probably true. It's probably true. And in that sense, it doesn't really matter whether we act with, to protect nature, to preserve nature, to develop a sustainable relationship with nature, because we think this is good from a spiritual or type of perspective, whether we see ourselves belonging to something bigger than just human society, whether we believe that the parts out there, the snow leopards and the algae, have intrinsic value, have a telos, a purpose, and deserve to be left alone right, to the greatest extent possible, deserve to be allowed to flourish in their worlds unmolested by us. Doesn't matter if we have a much more anthropocentric view, and we just worry about the way in which what we do to nature affects other people, people living in different countries, people living who will, will live in the years ahead. However we move into this space, 
it looks like there's a very large area in which we could all be making better decisions. Where we could all be doing things which we generally see as good and right and fair and just. And just like if we, treated, if we changed subsidies, unfair subsidies and things like energy, we'd probably have a lot of leverage to move towards alternative forms of energy. Just as if, just as if we use information technology effectively to make big complex issues more manageable. If we committed ourselves not just to talking about how moral we are, how ethical we are, and how much we'd like to live in a moral world, Unfortunately, our business leaders and our politicians have made it more or less impossible for us, and therefore the best thing to do is to throw in the towel and give up. If we made that same commitment, then we probably would be able to have a dramatic impact. I want to suggest we're far too early in this process of environmental rescue around the world to be stymied by areas where people disagree. Environmental ethics has largely been caricatured as the realm of eco-terrorists and animal rights and animal liberationists and people who are ungrounded and out of touch and elitist. There's a whole lot of reasons people have, have criticized the notion of thinking about nature from a moral perspective. But those aren't very compelling in the end. In the end, the choices are pretty stark. We may not agree with Peter Singer's argument that there's no obvious reason, there's no obvious moral boundary between species that should stop us from having sexual relationships with other animals. We may find that ridiculous, but then devoting the huge amount of attention that has been devoted to that issue, sort of a waste of time because really it's a small squeaky wheel. What we all can agree on is that we should have clean water. Everybody in the world can pretty much agree that we should have clean water, that we should protect water, that we shouldn't allow the world to turn into that. We shouldn't be deterred and sidetracked by the things which move us into realms where there are no answers. Where there are loud voices, but not real solutions to the question of sustainability. And we should focus on the areas in which we can make a, con a considerable difference. I think that in the end, you know, there's a video I invite you to watch but I run out of time. Um, however you cut into it these days, however you cut into the issue of, of the link between the good life the fair life, the just life, and the way we interact with the world, the, the, the non-human world around us, however you cut into it. If your aspiration is sustainability, then you cannot escape the fact that at some point we have tough moral decisions to make. And these are not going to be easy. Moral life is not easy. Moral life is not handed to you. Moral life does not come without any requirement for sacrifice, for change, for commitment. Moral life is a tough life. It's like learning to be an accomplished musician or an artist. It's a tough life, but it's almost certainly as essential to the project of sustainability as rethinking some of our economic arrangements, rethinking some of our technological innovations, rethinking how we handle the cascade of science which is descending into our lives. So ethics, environmental ethics has gotten a bad name over the past 10 or 20 years. And I think it's a bad name because it's largely been caricatured. I think that it is impossible to, to promote sustainability without thinking through our behavior in terms of whether whether it is good, right, and just. Thank you.